Hi, Ned. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Ned, we live in unprecedented times, and I couldn't think of anyone more insightful to discuss this with than you. But first, I have a personal question. In 2006, you received the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences. What did that feel like, and what does this distinction mean to you? Well, I had thought for a very long time that I would get the Nobel Prize. Uh, and uh, at some point, I really began to forget about it. And then I got it. <laughs> so it was uh, very impactful emotionally. Uh, it wasn't something that I was any longer expecting and counting on. Uh, and it was ex especially nice that uh, that um, I was the sole recipient. That's pretty special. I think it happens only once, maximum twice uh, every decade. So uh, it was uh, in every way uh, quite wonderful. That's fascinating, but I, I do have to point out that I noticed that you are unusually uh, modest about it, um, humble. Like in your office, there isn't a single picture of it. I don't, uh, no, I don't bring it up. I, I think people people know I have the Nobel Prize. In the most cases, that's the only thing they know about me is I have a Nobel Prize. So that, that's not, um, I don't have to go around uh, trumpeting it. It's, um, I, 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 uh, no, I, I, I don't, and I don't think it's so unusual that people don't talk a lot about their Nobel Prizes. See, I said you were very humble about it. Well, I think it's a unique distinction, and it's terribly impressive, and I think any, everybody can relate that it must be very gratifying and exciting to get it after putting in so much hard work and distinguishing yourself. Um, but coming to the current problems. You have argued in a recent compelling article in Project Syndicate that pandemics demand, quote, not only vast government spending, but also intervention, including a temporary state-led reorganization of the entire economy. What would such a state-led reorganization of the entire economy look like? Well, when I wrote that, I was uh, puzzled because I, I didn't understand why so many people thought that all we had to do was pep up aggregate demand. I thought that was so crazy because what we had on our hands was not a demand shock. It was a health shock, a kind of distinctive, peculiar kind of supply shock. So I started thinking in new directions and, um, uh, Yes, I, I, I do think that various interventions are, are surely necessary. And um, since I made those that remark, uh, a, gr a great many uh, interventions have already been uh, taken. In the United States, for example, the Defense Production Act of 1950 was invoked uh, to... Uh, require uh, some American manufacturers to produce masks and ventilators. It didn't do it out of uh, some spontaneous desire to meet the market. Uh, they, they were directed to do that by the, uh, by the federal government. Do you have any other examples? I believe you also said that the government should even temporarily take over certain industries or companies. Well, I, I was saying that that could be necessary depending on how bad the situation got. It cannot be ruled out. But I, I didn't mean to say that uh, the entire economy or even a big chunk of it would be put under complete government control, mm -hmm. just that government spending is not the answer, and what, we, what, what is the answer is for the government to act, and, and, and this will, it, it, in, various, in various cases, involve um, uh, directing, invoking the Defense Production Act 
direct corporations to shift what they're producing, mm -hmm. produce more or produce less. Well, ownership would remain in the hands of the shareholders. It's so in that sense, it's capitalism, but uh, it's, it's sort of a temporary, temporary modification of capitalism in that the owners don't have uh, complete control for a while, while uh, steps are being taken to uh, save the country, so to speak. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very conclusive argument, and I totally see the point and would agree. The only thing is, do you think that there are enough checks and balances in place when it comes to governments that are autocratic or corrupt or incompetent, without naming any? I'd, I'd, I'd be the first to agree that uh, there's an awful lot of uh, incompetence and uh, self-serving uh, activity in the public sector, politically motivated actions. It's not a pretty picture. Hmm. Well, perhaps when we get over the hump, um, I, I think it's probably important for people to, you know, uh, gain steam again and be innovative. And that brings me to your last book, Mass Flourishing where you elaborated how grassroots-based innovation in societies lead to economic prosperity for nations. First, um, how do you define innovation? Well, in innovation, in, innovation in my definition is a, a new product or a new method production that succeeds in the marketplace. Now, measuring it is somewhat complicated, requires a statistical procedure of some sort. In, in, in my new book, uh, Dynamism, uh, that's one of the missions of the book, to, to uh, try to estimate, the, the, not just to try, but also to proceed to estimate the rate of innovation Estimate, sorry, estimate that part of the estimated rate of innovation that is not the result of um, the growth rate, of not, not the result of other forces like the growth of the capital stock. The country where output is growing because the capital stock is growing is mm -hmm. not a country that, 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 would, that we would not call that innovation. That's called capital deepening. So innovation is sort of left. What, what is it? No, let's not put it that way. Innovation on top of the pyramid. Uh, a, a whole lot of forces are going on affecting productivity. But um, innovation is a, is a key driver of uh, productivity growth. Mm -hmm. But then, based on what you just said, how do you assess the level of innovation in the U.S. versus in Europe, and in particular in Germany? I think the rate of innovation was generally a little slower in Germany, France, and Britain than in the U.S. up to about 1940. But after the war, um, innovation in Europe was generally much slower. While in the U.S., innovation held up pretty well right until about 1970. And then innovation has been terrible ever since, with the exception of the uh, years of the uh, information revolution, Silicon Valley, uh, from 1995 to about 2004. Without exception, we've had tremendously slow innovation, and of course this is showing up as a tremendously slow productivity growth. All right, so we were talking about Germany, and you know Germany has this large um, Mittelstand, medium-sized companies, and it's very entrepreneurial. And um, I was just wondering, because you advocate for grassroots on up innovations of individuals and and is that 
still a realistic possibility in view of record income wealth and um, opportunity inequality and decreasing social mobility. And then also big monopolization of big corporations. Like, do individuals get crowded out by big capital, big corporations and lobbyists? Um, big capital and big corporate players and political lobbyists, uh, I think you were dead right about that. Though I, I think that our countries can, can do something to push back against those for forces. And uh, I would say that the, um, the biggest losses of innovation seem to be in the familiar traditional industries, such as the automotive industry or even Broadway theater, they're just crashingly boring. Nothing is happening. The problem there is not big capital. It's not big corporate players, I don't think, and political lobbyists. Yeah, I think it's something fundamental, something deep down. I think the problem is more in society than it is in the economy. Your new book, Dynamism, which you mentioned and which will be out, uh, will be published on May 5th. Um, you argue that economic health depends on the presence of values such as individualism and self-expression. And I earlier, or you, we earlier talked about Silicon Valley and big capital. And I have a feeling that young people, tech entrepreneurs, uh, don't necessarily want to create or come up with a unique invention for the sake of invention, but they want to, you know, they want to collect a lot of capital and then ideally be bought by Google or Facebook or another big uh, corporation. So do you think our values are skewed? And how do you, how do you actually propagate new, more substantial values in society? The people in society don't any longer have the, the right stuff. I think that's um, really a very basic problem. Innovation springs from people that, that like to use their imagination and their creativity to conceive of better ways of making things and new things to make. Enthusiasm for that sort of thing, dedication to that sort of thing, fascination with it, that's so basic, so central. I don't know whether you noticed a, little, a, a single sentence barely squeezed into uh, my previous book, Mass Flourishing. I, I was able to stick in a, a quotation by uh, Abraham Lincoln, that uh, he, he'd just taken a trip through America and decided whether he wanted to be president or not. And uh, he discovered something he was totally unprepared for. He said there was a passion for the new. Everybody was interested in new things, making new things, consuming new things, and so forth. So this, this phenomenon uh, is not there anymore. Not, not there in America, not there in Germany, France, Britain. And, and I think it represents, I think it causes, it is the lot of values that, that used to drive innovative activity. How do you bring that back? How do you, how do you ignite that education? Does it have to come from the top? I just don't know how this could be fundamentally changed Firstly, and secondly, what do you think the impact will be of now mass unemployment and poverty and depression level, you know, economic standards in the U.S.? Will people be even more risk averse and more afraid to go out of their comfort zone and try new things? Or do you think the opposite may actually be the case? I recognize that individualism is maybe not the most admired value maybe not the most attractive value to, to a great many people. But thinking for yourself and following your curiosity and, and, and your ambition, uh, that's sort of basic. We're getting new things. We're finding new ways. Uh, I, I, w without that, it, it's difficult to imagine how there can be 
any uh, any kind of uh, broad innovation going on. Individualism, in this case, in this context, I think means um, a desire to express oneself, one's individuality. It's not an indifference to other people. Now, in in um, Mass Flourishing, I, I wrote about a trinity of uh, values. Individualism, which is one, but there's also vitalism, such as taking an initiative and competing. And then there's also the desire to express oneself, expressionism, self-expression, desire to create, to explore, to make a mark. I think all these values are, are, these are the things that we've lost. I think the only way I see forward is to try to uh, inculcate, horrible word, but, but to encourage the acquisition of these values, beginning with young people in school and so forth. So I think we have to, we have to, Schools before college and, and uh, university and, and even in college uh, should put a whole lot of time into books about achievement, exploration, adventure, challenge, all that. I had a whole bunch of that stuff when I was uh, a young teenager starting with uh, miscellaneous books in my father's bookcase upstairs, which I discovered. And I, 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 but, but there wasn't so much I noticed in, in, in uh, the high school. I think we, that's, that's just huge. We have to, have to change the education system to, so that it proclaims the, the importance of all these things that I, I was talking about. Mm -hmm. How do you view the impact of artificial intelligence on innovation and jobs and societies? Do you see AI more as a potential Robogadon job killer or as an opportunity that frees up people to do more meaningful and fulfilling work? I would think that um, the invasion of the robots will uh, create some, some difficulties. But with regard to that, um, I'm an optimist. I note that when masses of immigrants poured into America, which of course other things equal would tend to drive down wage rates, Native Americans coped well enough. They found other opportunities. And thanks to innovation going on, uh, wages were, were rising. So they just were not rising maybe as fast as they would have had there not been Uh, the waves of uh, waves of immigration. So we we could hope this time that that um, that when the robots arrive, uh, workers will be able to find uh, new opportunities. New new people coming into the labor force won't move into the industries they might might have moved into, but will move to other industries that they might not have thought about. Mm -hmm. So the trouble is that uh, in America and Europe both, we've lost the huge innovation that we used to have that would have pulled up wage rates. In the 19th century, nobody noticed that immigrants were, were dragging down, were, were, were a bit of a drag on the rise of wage rates. They only saw that wage rates were rising. And that now, of course... People, people would be horrified. Uh, will be horrified if, 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 uh, if uh, would be horrified if robots came in and and uh, drove down wage rates. But uh, wage rates. But I, I don't. If we can get a little more innovation going on, and if we can find uh, new industries where uh, young people can can uh, go into. That, that offer decent pay, then I think we'll, we'll be fine. I can't guarantee that that's going to work out well, but I think it's a possibility.
Mm -hmm. While the U.S. economy has to a large extent been driven by individualism, European economies were based more on collectivism as a result of the Second World War. In view of crises like um, increasing inequality and pandemics and, the, and climate change, doesn't individualism have to be encompassed by a social contract, which arguably is currently defunct, in order to provide for social cohesion and prevent the toxic populism and polarization and protectionism that we're currently seeing? Great question. I'd be all in favor of the social contract as long as it focused on wage earners at the bottom, not the middle. And as long as as we stand ready to deal with the, um, the tremendous problems presented by the uh, uh, worsening environment. So I, I, I don't know whether those are in the social contract. I do think, though, that if those... If those if those considerations are primary, poverty and the environment, then there's there's then I don't know that there's going to be much money left over for for um, a social contract. Mm -hmm. And almost 20 years ago, you founded the Center on Capitalism and Society at Columbia University, which counts amongst its members the who's who of economics and other academic uh, disciplines. What motivated you to do so, and how would you describe its mission? Well, it seemed to some of us that um, economics wasn't looking uh, at, at largely capitalist economies, uh, real-life capitalist economies with uh, some innovation and a huge amount of uncertainty real-life economies and economies with some that raise some moral questions about poverty, growth, rising foreign trade, and so forth. So some of us at Columbia, mostly economists, but a few others too, decided to form a research center to um, examine various issues that raised, as we see it, in the American economy and, and uh, other economies. I'd say that we're not on a mission so much as, as, as we are asking questions and seeking answers. Of course, um, I had no idea that the center would become visible and uh, for some quite attractive and, and quite interesting. And that's been very gratifying to me. Well, I think your work is admirable, and I would encourage everybody to check out the website at the center and the work and the people who are participating there and check out the publications, and we'll make sure to include the link, the website link, in the podcast description. Ned, thank you so much for joining us today. It was a pleasure and an honor to have you. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Ned. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.